Tales from the Vault, Episode 17 The Terror by Guy de Maupassant You say you cannot possibly understand it, and I believe you. You think I am losing my mind. Perhaps I am, but for other reasons than those you imagine, my dear friend. Yes, I am going to be married, and will tell you what has led me to take that step. I may add that I know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow. I have only seen her four or five times. I know that there is nothing unpleasing about her, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout, so, of course, the day after tomorrow, I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl such as you may find by the gross, well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her, Mademoiselle La Jolle is a very nice girl. And tomorrow they will say, What a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls, whom one is glad to have for one's wife, till the moment comes when one discovers that one happens to prefer all other women to that particular woman whom one has married. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reason that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am afraid of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity me and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side, so that I may be able to ask some sudden question, a stupid question even, if I feel inclined, so that I may hear a human voice, and feel that there is some waking soul close to me, someone whose reason is at work, so that when I hastily light the candle I may see some human face by my side, because, because, I am ashamed to confess it, because I am afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me, yet. I am not afraid of any danger. If a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, well, it must be told. I am afraid of myself, afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects which are animated, as far as I am concerned, by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look round, and of course nothing is to be seen, and I wish that there were something there, no matter what, as long as it was something tangible. I am frightened merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what, behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard or under my bed, and yet all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, and I turn round suddenly, because I am afraid of what is behind me, although there is nothing there, and I know it. I become agitated. I feel that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed, and hide under the clothes, and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair, and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is alight on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet I dare not do it. It is very terrible, is it not, to be like that? 
Formerly, I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite calm, and went up and down my apartment without anything disturbing my peace of mind. Had anyone told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of most improbable fear, such a stupid and terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I went to bed slowly, without locking it, and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year in a very strange manner on a damp autumn evening. When my servant had left the room after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and even without energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy, a prey to one of those fits of despondency, without any apparent cause, which make us feel inclined to cry or to talk, no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. I felt that I was alone, and my rooms seemed to me to be more empty than they had ever been before. I was in the midst of an infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but a kind of nervous impatience seemed to affect my legs, so I got up and began to walk about again. I was, perhaps, rather feverish, for my hands, which I had clasped behind me, as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then suddenly a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my rooms. So I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon I felt that I could not possibly remain quiet, and so I got up again and determined to go out, to pull myself together, and to find a friend to bear me company. I could not find anyone, so I walked to the boulevard to try to meet some acquaintance or other there. It was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight, while the oppressive warmth of the almost impalpable rain lay heavily over the streets and seemed to obscure the light of the lamps. I went on slowly, saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. I glanced into several cafés, from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonnière, and saw many unhappy-looking individuals sitting at the tables who did not seem to even have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time I wandered aimlessly up and down, and about midnight I started for home. I was very calm and very tired. My janitor opened the door at once, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had probably just come in. When I go out I always double-lock the door of my room, and I found it merely closed, which surprised me, but I supposed that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in and found my fire still burning, so that it lighted up the room a little, and while in the act of taking up a candle, I noticed somebody sitting in my armchair by the fire, warming his feet with his back toward me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought, very naturally, that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, to whom I had said I was going out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately, and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head, and he had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite distinctly. His right arm was hanging down and his legs were crossed. The position of his head, which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be? I asked myself. I could not see clearly, as the room was rather dark, so I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and it came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there. The seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment I drew back as if confronted by some terrible danger. Then I turned, feeling someone behind my back. Then, immediately, an imperious need to see the chair again made me turn once more. And I remained standing, panting in horror, 
so distraught that I could not collect my thoughts, and ready to faint. But I am a cool man, and soon recovered myself. I thought, it is a mere hallucination, that is all, and I immediately began to reflect on this phenomenon. Thoughts fly quickly at such moments. I had been suffering from an hallucination. That was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid and had acted regularly and logically, so there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision, one of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous seizure of the optical apparatus, nothing more. The eyes were rather congested, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire, in doing so I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself with a jump, as if somebody had touched me from behind. I was certainly not, by any means, calm. I walked up and down a little, and hummed a tune or two. Then I double-locked the door, and felt rather reassured, now, at any rate, nobody could come in. I sat down again and thought over my adventure for a long time. Then I went to bed and blew out my light. For some minutes all went well. I lay quietly on my back, but presently an irresistible desire seized me to look round the room, and I turned over on my side. My fire was nearly out, and the few glowing embers threw a faint light on the floor by the chair, where I fancied I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken. There was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed, and tried to get to sleep, as the room was now dark. But I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes, when, in my dream, I saw all the scene which I had previously witnessed as clearly as if it were reality. I woke up with a start, and having lit the candle, sat up in bed, without venturing even to try to go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me for a few moments, in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought that I was cured, and slept peacefully till noon. It was all past and over. I had been feverish, had had a nightmare. What do I know? I had been ill, in fact, but nevertheless I thought I was a great fool. I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I dined at a restaurant, and afterward went to the theatre, and then started for home. But as I got near the house I was once more seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid lest fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour I wandered up and down the pavement, then, feeling that I was really too foolish, I returned home. I breathed so hard that I could hardly get upstairs, and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes. Then suddenly I had a courageous impulse, and my will asserted itself. I inserted my key into the lock, and went into the apartment with a candle in my hand. I kicked open my bedroom door, which was partly open, and cast a frightened glance toward the fireplace. There was nothing there. Ah, what a relief, and what a delight! What a deliverance! I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured, and kept turning round with a jump. The very shadows in the corners disquieted me. I slept badly, and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time I have been afraid of being alone at night. I feel that the spectre is there, close to me, around me, but it does not appear to me again. And supposing it did, what would it matter, since I do not believe in it, and I know that it is nothing? Yet it still worries me, because I am constantly thinking of it. 
his right arm hanging down and his head inclined to the left like a man who was asleep. I don't want to think about it. Why, then, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid. But who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears, and in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes, it is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen my backbone, so to say, but I cannot remain at home, because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again. He will not show himself again. That is all over. But he is there, all the same, in my thoughts. He remains invisible, but that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the closed cupboard, in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door or the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light on the dark places, he is there no longer. But I feel that he is behind me. I turn round, certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again. But for all that, he is behind me. It is very stupid. It is dreadful. But what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place, I feel certain that he would not be there any longer. For he is there just because I am alone, simply and solely because I am alone. Thanks for listening. This was a DSB Audio production, narrated and produced by David Sweeney Bear. Visit dsbaudio.com for more full-length audiobooks. If you enjoyed this episode, leave me a comment and let me know what you thought. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast for future episodes, and check out the DSB Audio channel on youtube.com. Keep listening for a sneak preview of another great podcast you might like to check out. Until the next time, happy listening. And we've hijacked the signal. See, Harvey, I told you we could hijack other podcasts. Never doubted you, DJ. Quick, Parker, do the thing where you tell them about our podcast, where we interview wastelanders, share survival tips, and explore wacky storylines overdosed with exposition. I mean, you just did. Did what? Hey, listeners, join the Afterworlds podcast as we explore a fictional post-apocalyptic future. Set in the world of Afterworlds live-action role-playing game, it's an episodic improv show, available on all major audio platforms. The Afterworlds podcast. (laughs) 